Well, I am so thankful for this series we've we've been in called By Faith, Saying Yes to God Even When It's Scary, because these men and women through Hebrews chapter 11 that we've learned about, they really do bring comfort to our heart when we realize they're real people that went through real things. And so I'm so thankful to be up here to be able to share with you the next part of this series. I want to say this, because I totally believe that it's true. There are a lot of things to be scared of right? There's all sorts of things to be scared of. I'll share with you a story about my life. When I was a kid, I really struggled with some angst and some worry pretty frequently about most things. And one of the areas where I struggled the most was feeling as if something I'm going through or that I went through, that I would be the only person that had ever experienced that. And so when something bad would happen to me, I would get hurt or whatever it might be. One of my go-to questions would be like, has, you know, dad or mom, has this ever happened to you? Because I know if it happened to you, then like you're alive, right? So I should be able to be okay. So one day, I don't, I really don't remember how exactly the scenario started, but a neighbor had asked my brother and I if we wanted to go on a bicycle ride around the block. Now, where I live, a block is many miles, and you go up and down lots of hills. And so my brother and I are riding, and I remember this because it hurt a lot. So my brother and I are riding, and we're at the top of this hill on a gravel road, and it's a steep hill. The type you look at that's like, oh, this is going to be fun. And I told my brother, I'm going to go straight down, no brakes. And he looks at me, he says, Isaac, don't do that that's dangerous. And I said, I know, but this is going to be so cool. He's like, Isaac, don't do that. And so I went straight down the hill. I mean, I was flying down the hill so fast. I remember thinking to myself, this is amazing. And as I was flying down the hill, I came to the realization that I was actually flying for a few moments (laughs) because my bike had completely been taken out from underneath me. And there I was like an eagle or something, just soaring down the mountain until the really brutal moment when I landed in the gravel. And I landed and just slid down the hill, and I was like a bloody mess. It was not great. Well, this is where I kind of, I had to ask my dad this morning to remind me of the details because this is where I kind of black out a little bit until I remember a little bit later. And I remember I got up and we went down. There was this junkyard with this kind of nasty trailer that was like the headquarters or something. So we went in and an individual let us use the phone because this was before cell phones, of course. And so we get, you know, we get there and I call and I let him know and my dad comes and picks me up. And the next memory I have is of being in a bathtub with like running water and my dad has tweezers and he's just... <laughs> slowly picking all the rocks out of all the wounds that I had, especially out of my knees. And I still have like a really gnarly scar on the one knee from where I like thought I could fly for just a moment. And my brother was so judgy. He's like, I told you not to do that. That was a bad idea. But I remember in the bathtub, I, as dad's, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I was really crying slash wailing as like a young, you know, six, seven, eight-year-old does. Has this ever happened to you? You know, I was really worried about it. And it turns out that, yes, he did get hurt. Who's surprised that he had been hurt in his life? You know, and there are all sorts of fears. Like, was I afraid of riding a bike after that? Sort of, right? Because that was really, really bad. But that's just one thing, you know, where it's like, okay, well, I guess you don't go on a bicycle ride if you're afraid you're going to wreck. Like, that's really the option, right? There are so many different things to be scared of. The author of Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament, he writes this, and it's, it's kind of humorous, though he does mean it in a serious sense. He says, when you dig a well, you might fall in. When you demolish an old wall, you could be bitten by a snake. When you work in a quarry, stones might fall and crush you. When you chop wood, there is danger with each stroke of your axe. Everything we do has an inherent fear that's attached to it, potentially, things we can be worried about. And in this series, we've been asking this question, what are you scared of? What things in your life bring you fear or worry? Now, my story about flying down the mountain and bearing the scars for your humor, like 15, 20 years later, is one thing. However, there is a fear that can tend to go a bit deeper. Let me read you just a real brief verse from Hebrews chapter 10. And this is the sort of stuff, as we've been studying the book of Hebrews, I come across this and I'm like, 
it's like one of those moments where the scripture kind of break checks you a little bit and makes you just go, ah, what do I, how do I deal with that? Because I don't like reading stuff like this, but it's in the scripture, so we have to deal with it. Hebrews 10 verse 26 says this, dear friends, if we deliberately continue sinning after we have received knowledge of the truth, there is no longer any sacrifice that will cover these sins. There is only the terrible expectation of God's judgment and the raging fire that will consume his enemies. And I would say this, and this verse points to it, it's perfectly normal to be scared of God. In fact, I would say a huge amount of human history has been defined because people were scared of whoever or whatever they believed to be God and the actions they take out of fear. Now, in all likelihood, you and I don't walk around going, I'm so scared of God, like I'm scared God is gonna smite me, even though we might kind of uh, say it in a little bit of a different way. Like this morning, you walked into like our beautiful church, right, and it's like nice and clean and everything is good, and you might walk in and say something like, this didn't happen when I walked in the church, and I can't believe that it didn't happen. Like the church ceiling didn't fall in and crush me when I walked in here. Well, why do we hear things like that and why do sometimes we kind of wonder if that's going to happen? It's because it's pretty normal to be kind of scared that our relationship with God is maybe on the rocks or like we don't live up to him, something like that. And so I would say this, that it's not normal to have peace with God. In fact, it is like the great exception of all religion for all time, that God would have provided a way for you to have peace with him and would have asked nothing of you and would have done all the work he needed to do to allow peace to be given to you. And so the hero of the story we're gonna look at today explains this or demonstrates this idea And so this is what I hope as you leave today in a little bit, that this is what you'll walk away with, that no matter what, God offers peace with him. So the question for you is, do you have peace with God? Do you really have peace with God? Are there areas of your life that still cause some turmoil in your heart that are robbing peacefulness from you. That's what we're gonna talk about. So to catch us up real quickly in where we're at with the heroes in Hebrews chapter 11, last week talked about Abraham. Now Abraham was told by God to go sacrifice your son to him, which was not weird at the time. Most gods would have asked that. But in the end, God is the one that provided the sacrifice. And so, He said that was never something that he wanted, but Abraham, by faith, simply obeyed God every step of the way, and God honored him for that. So three generations later, Abraham's family, um, his great-grandson named Joseph, found himself in Egypt because of some nasty things that happened with his family. And while he was in Egypt, a famine struck all of the land, all the nearby land, the kind of like the known world at that point in time. But because God brought Joseph into Egypt, Joseph was able to bring his whole family into Egypt and save them because Egypt had food. And so then all the people come to Egypt and you fast forward several hundred years, like 400 years, and the Hebrew people had grown so large that the Pharaoh at that time was scared of them and enslaved them. So now they, the, all the Hebrew people, all of the sons and daughters of Abraham were living as slaves in Egypt until the Exodus story where God strikes Egypt with plagues and brings them out of bondage led by Moses. And Moses stands before a sea, the Red Sea, that is between the Hebrew people and the Egyptian army that's chasing them. And God supernaturally splits the Red Sea apart, drying the ground that the Israelites were to walk on and cross straight through the Red Sea into safety. 
And as the Egyptian people followed them, the, the, the walls of the water came crashing down and destroyed the Egyptian army. God then gives Moses the Ten Commandments, like you see in this picture, and establishes what he calls the law. So he gave his people all the information they needed to have an entire civilization as they went to the promised land. Well, several years later, the people are at the border of the promised land that God said, I have given this to you. And Moses sends 12 spies into the land to look at the land. 10 of them came back and said, there is no way we can go into this land because it's too rich, there's giants, we are, we are like grasshoppers in the sight of the people of this land, we can't do it. Only two people believed God could deliver them into the land and follow through with his promise. Two of the spies, one named Joshua and one named Caleb. The other 10 got the people so worked up that they completely rebelled against God. And so God said to them, fine, none of you will go into the promised land. None of you who are alive except your children and then their children from there. And so 40 years go by as the children of Abraham, the Hebrew people, wander around in the wilderness waiting for that generation to pass away. And everybody does, except for Caleb and Joshua. So Moses dies, and the control is turned over to Joshua. And the people looked at Joshua just like they did Moses. And so that's where our story picks up in Joshua chapter 2. Joshua is told, we're getting ready to go into the promised land. God is delivering it to us. And before then, what I want you to do is go scout out the land. And so here's what happens. Joshua chapter 2, verse 1. Then Joshua secretly sent out two spies from the Israelite camp at Acacia Grove. He instructed them, scout out the land on the other side of the Jordan River, especially around Jericho. So here's what the promised land looked like at that time, where God was going to give them. This whole area, you have the Sea of Galilee, where ultimately Jesus would walk on water um, later on, way in the future of um, their history. But if you go all the way down south, this is the Jordan River that goes into the Dead Sea. And if you zoom in on it, you can see that Jericho is right over here. And across the Jordan River is where the people were at Acacia Grove. And so the people are there. Joshua sends spies into a shallow crossing of the Jordan River, sends the spies over into Jericho to see what's going on. And so that's where the story really picks up. Joshua 2. So... So the two men set out and came to the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there that night. Rahab will be the hero of this entire story, and she's a prostitute. In fact, she's such a hero and is so incredible that the Hebrew people and even Christians for some time have tried to downplay the reality of her profession. They said maybe she kept an inn or maybe she was like a waykeeper, something like that, and probably she actually did. However, in the New Testament, the time of Jesus, the apostles, when they would talk about Rahab, they would always use the word porne. Porne always meant prostitute. Whether it was in the works of Plato or um, any other Greek philosophers or the scripture, porne always meant prostitute. Why is that important? Because it's important to know that Rahab's life is going to demonstrate something very, very powerful to us. But we can't ignore the reality of the hero of this story. Matt Chandler is a Bible teacher that I greatly respect, and I think he puts out some really wonderful things. And he said this about Rahab. It's so beautiful. He said, no little girl dreams of being a prostitute when they grow up. You become a prostitute because very wicked, evil, demonic, and deplorable things happen to you. You are used and abused and treated as a commodity. You are treated like a soulless recreational vehicle. Did Rahab make the choice to be a prostitute? To some regard, surely. Was Rahab a victim of a terrible culture that forced her into a position that was lower than any other you could have? Definitely. Rahab is what we would call hopeless. A pagan culture and a woman and a prostitute 
no value to society. And I think that many of you relate to this feeling of hopelessness. Because at some level, though you might not be as far as Rahab is, though with enough people, there are things going on in this room and in the service before that would probably surprise us. Hopelessness is like a little seed that gets planted by the enemy. And over time, it grows and it grows and it grows until no matter what the cause is, we're overwhelmed by it and we feel like, what's the point? Why even try? Because I'm never getting out of this. Rahab demonstrates this to us. She was absolutely stuck. And so, word gets out to the king. But someone told the king of Jericho, some Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. Now this is really, really interesting that the Hebrew spies, followers of the one true God, landed in the house of a prostitute. Why? Why in the world would they be there? Here's what I would argue, okay? If you or I ended up in a brothel and we found out about it, it would be pretty uncomfortable to have that conversation, right? We wouldn't really like it. So when we read this in scripture, we ought to pause and go, what is happening here? And so a man named Skip Heisel, he's a pastor of a, um, a really cool church. He brought up some points, and I was like, that's the first time I've ever heard that, and I think that it's really helpful. Point number one, why would they be there? Well, where would you go into a city as a foreigner if you were looking to be accepted? without anybody really questioning you. Probably the house of somebody who would accept anybody for payment, where nobody would be turned away. A place where you could have momentary safety that no one would really bat an eye at you. So it's likely that the spies went there because it was a place where they didn't have to wonder, could they get in? Would they be able to infiltrate from wherever location they picked? But second, who in all of the city might have the dirtiest details of everything that's going on in that city. Likely somebody having sex with them all the time. And in those most intimate of ways, hearing things that men and maybe even women would have just thrown out there because you're trash anyway, I can say whatever I want. But she was listening and she knew. And so the spies go there and they're different than the people of Jericho that went in to use and to abuse her. And so word gets out to the king, and the text continues. So the king of Jericho sent orders to Rahab, bring out the men who have come into your house, for they have come here to spy out the whole land. But here's the cool part of the story. Rahab had hidden the two men. Rahab we know that her interaction with the Hebrews was different because whatever conversation they had with Rahab led her to a firm belief that it was better to hide them in her house or on top of her house, as it might turn out, to hide them than to turn them over to the king of Jericho. And so she had hidden the two men. And the text continues, but she replied, yes, the men were here earlier, but I don't know and didn't know where they were from. They left the town at dusk. As the gates were about to close, I don't know where they went. If you hurry, you probably could catch up with them. Well, actually, she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them beneath the bundles of flax that she had laid out. And so the king's men went looking for the spies along the road leading to the shallow crossing of the Jordan River. And as soon as the king's men had left, the gate of Jericho was shut. Here's the deal. Rahab had two choices to make. Put her trust in the leaders of Jericho or put her trust in these Hebrew spies. And either way, this choice had severe consequences. If the, the leaders of Jericho found out she was lying, dead. She's done. She was already throwaway garbage anyway, according to them, right? Certainly not according to God, but according to the culture. So she would have been done. And if um, you know, and so if she put her faith in Jericho, then she knew what the spies were saying. So then maybe she believed she was on the wrong side of God himself. And no matter what happens here, this choice had really severe consequences. And the text continues, before the spies went to sleep that night, 
Rahab went up on the roof to talk with them. I know the Lord has given you this land, she told him. We are all afraid of you. Everyone in the land is living in terror. For we have heard how the Lord made a dry path for you through the Red Sea when you left Egypt. And we know what you did to Sihon and Og, the two Amorite kings east of the Jordan River, whose people you completely destroyed. No wonder our hearts have melted in fear. No one has the courage to fight after hearing such things. For the Lord your God is the supreme God of the heavens above and of the earth below. What an extraordinary thing to say coming from somebody like Rahab. And I want to point this out to you because I think this is really beautiful. This is a change of tone from before. Do you remember when the 12 spies went into the land? 10 of them came back and said, there's no way we can go in there. They're giants. They'll kill us. We can't. We're in too much danger. And only Joshua and Caleb said, God has already given us the land. Well, here's what was really happening. God had already, in a sense, gone in before them and caused terror to fall upon the people in the land, in the promised land that were occupying it. And Rahab reveals this. We are all terrified of you. We know what you did. We know that when you left Egypt, the Red Sea itself parted. We know that God gave you victory over these kings. We know we are terrified. And she acknowledged your God clearly is the supreme God of everything, is above all, and is absolutely all-powerful. Had the Hebrew people had their eyes open, like Joshua and Caleb, they would have known God already gave them the promised land. But now we're 40 years later when these spies are in Jericho. Everybody was afraid, and they should have been afraid. Listen to what Lauren Cottle from study.com in a journal article that she wrote. Listen to what she says. The ancient Canaanite religion was polytheistic. Their religious practices included sexual fertility rites, worship of multiple gods, and human sacrifice. Human sacrifice, especially child sacrifice, very common in the Near Eastern religions. It was no surprise that there was human sacrifice involved. But they certainly knew that the Hebrew God did not stand for this sort of a thing. And so Rahab added up all the evidence. Again, just because she was lesser than everybody else doesn't mean that she was dumb. She was listening. She could put pieces together. In fact, she was an incredible hero in this story for hiding these spies. And so what was the conclusion she drew? The overwhelming conclusion was that Jericho was in trouble. Beyond that, Rahab was in triple trouble. Why? First, she was a Canaanite living in Jericho. Not great, as she already said. Second, she was a woman. She had no real value or worth or power or control in society. Not that she was not valuable, but as far as her worth in the culture, she just didn't really have any. And third, she was a prostitute. Of all the people easy to throw away as cannon fodder, Rahab was going to be pretty high on the list. And she knew she was seriously in trouble. She was scared of God. Her fear was of God had raised up within her. It's why she said all the things that she did about who God is. But here's the beautiful thing. She threw herself into the hands of God. Listen to what she says to the spies. Now swear to me by the Lord that you will be kind to me and my family since I have helped you. Give me some guarantee that when Jericho is conquered, you will let me live along with my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all of their families. When faced with the fear of God, she threw herself into him because what else is she going to do? And by doing this, she set an example for the rest of history, for you and for me. Because she demonstrated that no matter what, God offers us peace with him. She gave herself over to the Lord and said, what else can I do besides submit to this power that's before me in my guilt and in my shame and in my embarrassment and in my fear? What else can I do? And she didn't know what the response of the spies would be or the response of God would be. 
But this is how it continues. We offer our own lives as a guarantee for your safety, the men agreed. If you don't betray us, we will keep our promise and be kind to you when the Lord gives us this land. Then, since Rahab's house was built into the town wall, she let them down by a rope through the window, and they escaped. Escape to the hill country, she told them. Hide there for three days from the men searching for you. Then, when they have returned, you can go on your way. Before they left, the men told her, we will be bound by the oath we have taken only if you follow these instructions. When we come into the land, you must leave the scarlet rope hanging from the window through which you let us down. And all your family members, your father, your mother and brothers, and all your relatives, they must be inside the house. If they go into the street and are killed, it will not be our fault. But if anyone lays a hand on the people inside this house, we will accept responsibility for their death. And if you betray us, however, we are not bound by this oath in any way. I accept your terms, she replied. And she sent them on their way, leaving the scarlet rope hanging from the window. The sad part of this is that it was only Rahab who surrendered. In all the city, all the people scared of God, all the people that knew what God would do, that knew the power of God, only Rahab surrendered. And so, I ask this question, are you scared of God? Do you have some low-grade or high-grade fear of God? And maybe one way to figure it out is do you have peace with God? Are you and God doing okay? Is your relationship all right? Is there some stuff in your life that maybe you're scared of that is causing you not to have peace with who God is, with what he has to say. So I would challenge you with this. Really, there are only two options of paths forward when we don't have peace with God. The first one is that we can follow the example of Jericho, who did not submit and surrender to God, even though they knew that that was the supreme God of the heaven and earth. As the story continues, Joshua is instructed by the Lord himself that he is going to, God himself, is going to make the walls of the city fall down by his supernatural power. And the Hebrew army would simply walk up into Jericho. That's how God was going to bring victory. And so Joshua 6, 24 says, Then the Israelites burned the town and everything in it. Only the things made from silver, gold, bronze, or iron were kept for the treasury of the Lord's house. The end of the example that Jericho set is destruction in our own lives. I'm not saying God's going to lightning strike you. I'm saying a life where we rebel and don't follow what the Lord asks us to do results in destruction in your life and in the lives of those around you. The other option is that we follow the example of Rahab. Look at this, Joshua chapter six. Meanwhile, Joshua said to the two spies, keep your promise. Go to the prostitute's house and bring her out along with all of her family. And the men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab, her father, mother, brothers, and all the other relatives who were with her. They moved her whole family to a safe place near the camp of Israel. So Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute and her relatives who were with her in the house. Because she had hidden the spies, Joshua sent to Jericho. And she lives among the Israelites to this day. Joshua would, of course, know this as he was writing down his account that Rahab and their family, they became a part of Israel in this beautiful way. And it leads to this verse in Hebrews chapter 11 that is so simple, but it's so profound. Hebrews 11 verse 31 says this, it was by faith that Rahab the prostitute was not destroyed with the people in her city who refused to obey God, for she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. She becomes one of the greatest heroes 
of all of Israel and is mentioned in the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11 for people we should look at and glean wisdom from her life. The brother of Jesus, his name was James, he wrote this. Rahab the prostitute is another example. She was shown to be right with God by her actions when she hid those messengers and sent them safely away by a different road. It's simply beautiful, the legacy that was left by Rahab, even though in all other ways she was just considered valueless. I'll show you this picture. This is a picture of the lineage of Jesus himself. Jesus Christ is all the way over here, and this is found in Luke chapter 3. If you go up generation by generation by generation by generation, you hit King David. And if you go back just a few more generations, you hit Salmon. Salmon was the husband of Rahab. Rahab ended up being the great, 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 great grandmother of our Messiah, Jesus Christ. That is extraordinary. And it demonstrates to us that no matter what, God offers us peace with him. Look what Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says. Therefore, since we have been made right in God's eyes by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. What do we do? To follow Rahab's example, we trust God's promise. We read a little chunk of Hebrews chapter 10 um, during our worship portion of the service. And I want to read this to you again. This comes right before the scary passage that I read you before about God's wrath and, and fiery judgment, etc. Check this out. Look what else it says that is given to followers of Jesus by faith. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus, literally the presence of God. Let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean. And our bodies have been washed with pure water. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope that we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep his promises. No matter what, God offers us peace with him. There is no situation or circumstance or consequence or anything else in your life that can prevent you from receiving the peace of God when we follow Rahab's example and we trust in what he has to say and we obey what he has to say. There's nothing at all. And so here's what I would like us to do. I wanna give you a couple of moments to just sit and put some music on in the background And I want you to just sit and take a moment to pray and to meditate on this. The worship team is going to come up and they're going to lead us in song. And I'd like you, without, you know, distractions around you and without other people talking and all this stuff, I'd like you to take a moment to talk with the Lord about those areas of your life where you might feel like you don't have peace with him. And pray and say, God, reveal the things in my life and in my heart that I'm not feeling your comfort or I'm not feeling the peace that you offer. And so go ahead and take a couple of minutes to just pray on this and understand this statement that because of Jesus and no matter what, God offers us peace with him. Go ahead and take a few moments to pray.